So just a little bit about uh, Will's background. Um, he is now the state representative for District 71. And when Will ran for office, he ran on common sense principles. So that should align pretty well with us. Uh, he says that he is a fiscal conservative who understands the importance of balancing the budgets, keeping taxes low, and ensuring Florida is able to compete in today's global economy. And that's critically important, important as Rich knows, from some of the work that the environmental uh, working group's working on. Uh, Will was born in Bradenton, and his family has deep roots in Manatee County. He is a partner with the Blaylock Walters Law Firm, serves on the Manatee Chamber Board of Directors, and formerly served as the chair of Meals on Wheels in Manatee. He's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and received his JD from Stetson University College of Law. So let's give Will a big hand. Thank Welcome, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's certainly my pleasure to speak to you all today. And it reminds me uh, of my family story, my personal story. It kind of blends into why I'm here today regarding the environment. My grandparents moved here from Pikeville, Kentucky uh, in 1948. Okay? <laughs> And I moved here because my grandmother couldn't stand uh, the coal uh, uh, air in the, in the air. And so they were deciding between Florida and Colorado. And thankfully, they picked, they picked Florida. But a more interesting story, they started off on the Sarasota County side. I may have been a resident of Sarasota County, but my grandmother didn't like the taste of water, the water here. So, so they moved up north uh, into Bradenton. And uh, my, parent, or my grandparents opened up a motel on Tamiami Trail. And then my grandfather and my uncle started a chain of uh, sporting goods stores called Robbie Sporting Goods. So if you're, if you're from this area, you may remember uh, Robbie Sporting Goods. My, my dad joined them uh, years later. Um, and then uh, my, my parents met and, and had me, along with uh, two brothers. So uh, my dad and I have this debate all the time. I call myself a third generation Floridian. But he's like, Will, your grandfather wasn't born uh, in Florida. And I said, well, with this day and age in politics, you kind of can make up some stuff. So I'm a third generation Floridian. Uh, uh, so that's what I'm going to stand by. But, but it's my pleasure uh, to speak to you all, especially considering, frankly, uh, what we're going to, uh, the, the anniversary we're going to hit in a couple days, uh, September 11th. Um, and I'm not a veteran. Uh, I didn't serve like almost everyone uh, in this room did. And I don't know, I, I know you don't have to be thanked for your service, but on behalf of our great state, thank you uh, for your service. And, and September 11th reminds us of, of what can happen to us as a nation uh, if, we're not, if we're not vigilant. Um, and uh, we had a really tough tragedy. I don't know a lot about it, but a young man named Austin Stump, uh, an Army Ranger, lost his life. Um, he's actually from Bradenton. I uh, went to Manatee High School, just like I did. And uh, I, I, I don't know anything about the circumstances, but I did watch the video of his coffin uh, being lowered from the airplane at Sarasota uh, Manatee Airport. Um, everyone should watch that video. Not, I don't have to preach to the choir here, but, but just watching that and watching the family members, um, it's heartbreaking. But uh, um, it just reminds me um, of how important people like you are and were uh, to our great country. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm brand new to this process. So what I like to do with folks is kind of experience it from my eyes. I was elected for the first time in November. I've never held uh, public office uh, before. Like you said, I'm a lawyer. I'm a real estate lawyer of all things. So um, I got involved and I decided to run because I wanted to keep our great state moving forward. And any principles that allowed us to, to keep our state moving forward, um, I would advocate for those. Because I remember back in 2010 where we were economically as a state. And I don't want to ever see us go back there. So I ran. And uh, I won. And if you walk right across the street, uh, 41, you'll be in District 71. So District 71 includes mainly western Manatee County. If you split Manatee in half, I have the western half. I don't know if you've met Representative Gregory, but he represents the eastern half. And I represent a strip in Sarasota that goes all the way down to Siesta Key. So it's a really great district. And if you just look at the district, it just pops out water. Pops out water. And I'll talk about that, uh, talk about that in a second. So I was elected. And what's different about the state system and the federal system, there's no such thing as elect. I was immediately the representative. 
And what's a, what was a really neat thing is my predecessor, Jim Boyd, who's now running for the Senate uh, in, in Florida, was there to congratulate me. And he gave me the member's pin that the, the person before him got it, who's now the president of the Florida Senate, Bill Galvano. So I, I took a, uh, a call from the speaker who congratulated me, and my opponent uh, called me, which was very gracious uh, on her part. And then I had to hire staff. Uh, so I hired some great staff, and then we moved in what's called organizational session. So the Florida House elects their Speaker of the House, and the Florida Senate elects their President. The Senate started earlier, and I wanted to see um, Bill Galvano ascend to the presidency of the Senate. That's only happened, I believe, three times in Manatee County's history. It's never happened in Sarasota County's history. Uh, Sarasota's never had a Speaker of the House, I believe. Manatee's had a couple, so it's a big deal when a presiding officer um, from your area gets to the top of the food chain, so to speak, uh, in, in, in their respective uh, body. But as the big difference between the Senate and the House, the Senators love to hear themselves talk. I mean, oh my gosh, they were there. There's a speech and a second and a third. And my aide finally said, Will, you're not a Senator. Get out of the Senate. Get into the, the House. Uh, you're going to be late for your ceremony. So. Um, I, I rushed out of there after President Galvano officially got his votes, uh, took my dad. You're allowed to have one person uh, on the House floor seated down with you. It's a very high honor to be on the floor of a body. And they only allow one person, my, my, my mom and my brothers uh, and other friends and family were up in the gallery. But I, I took my dad, uh, so he got to sit uh, right next to me. And they brought all the freshmen up in groups of five. And the only thing I told myself was, well, please don't trip over the seal <laughs> in the middle of the floor. So uh, thankfully, uh, that didn't happen. And I got, I got officially sworn in. And we officially elected uh, the Speaker of the House. And he gave a wonderful speech. So then you move from organizational session to committee work. And actually, that's where we are right now in my second session, is we'll be going into our very first committee week next week. So uh, back, back last session, we had five committee weeks. And during these weeks, uh, we, we debate bills. Um, we have various meetings about the committees. And bills make it through uh, the process. Most bills need to make it through either two or three uh, committee stops. And I was very pleased to have, I believe, the most number of committees. The speaker assigned me to six committees, uh, which was a lot. But I love doing the work. I especially like the work on Ag and Natural Resources Subcommittee. Uh, the speaker assigned me to that, uh, to that subcommittee, and also higher ed, higher education subcommittee, which was a really, really neat thing to, to, to almost be in charge of the entire budget uh, for the higher education system uh, in the state of Florida. A couple other committees that I was on that may be of interest, criminal justice. Uh, so all those, all those criminal justice issues obviously flowed uh, through that committee. Gaming. I was on gaming. And an interesting little, I'll always remember this as a freshman, uh, sometimes a speaker assigns you a bill, and I was assigned a bill, and the very first bill that I presented was in front of gaming, and the speaker, um, to put it mildly, has an issue with the Florida lottery. Uh, he believes it preys on those that may not be able to afford the lottery, so he wanted a simple legend or disclaimer put on the lottery ticket, so I ran that bill. And uh, it was a pretty, I mean, Democrats and Republicans uh, supported the bill, the Florida lottery, uh, had some problems uh, with the bill. And actually, it passed both chambers, but the governor vetoed it. So interesting, my, my, one of my very first bills, Governor DeSantis vetoed it. But uh, uh, gaming was a great committee that I was on. Commerce was on commerce as well. So a lot of great committees. And frankly, uh, I've been assigned to the same committees uh, and one more uh, for next session. So I'm very happy that the speaker uh, has uh, um, faith in me that I can carry some of the important issues for this area and others uh, into committees, committee weeks. So you move through committee weeks. And then what I like about Florida, unlike our federal system, is we have a fixed session, 60 days. So all those bills that are filed die on the 60th day unless they pass all those committee stops and pass both chambers and then get to the governor's desk. Um, imagine if our federal system had such urgency where they're not, they're not continually in session. Uh, we have to, we have we have to get our bills through these committee slots or they die. So a lot of activity uh, during those last couple weeks of session uh, happens. And um, uh, to me, and this is why, why I 
kind of miss having Representative Good because we're kind of a yin to the yang. I'm a Republican. She's a Democrat. I always say we had an outstanding session. She always says we, have a dis we had a disastrous session. So it's always uh, kind of interesting to, to kind of have the fun debate, which we do. And uh, uh, that's what I really enjoy about the Florida legislature is we have some really tough debates on the House floor. But it's all cordial, I got to say. Some of my very dearest friends uh, are Democrats. Uh, and we've had some great debates and discussion. And I, and I think that's what makes our republic great, is when you have great debate on tough issues. Because I think better ideas uh, come out of debate and, frankly, compromise. So session lasts 60 days. And if you can get your bills through uh, those 60 days with both chambers uh, approving them, they go to the governor's desk. And one thing to keep in mind, you're going to, uh, from now through about halfway through session, you're going you're to read a bunch of headlines from, from all sorts of publications about bills being filed. Obviously, any representative or senator can file a bill. The trick is getting a bill through the system. Uh, to give some t statistics, about 1,500 bills were, were filed. Less than 200 passed both chambers. So it's very tough. And, I, and as someone that, that believes the power should be more in the people, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a problem with fewer bills being passed. If they're not meaningful bills, if they're not bills that, that can survive the scrutiny of both, of both bodies, then they probably don't deserve uh, to go um, and, and be law. So keep that in mind when, uh, uh, when you read a headline about a bill being, being filed. It's, it most likely will not, become, will not become law. Of anything we do, there's really only one responsibility that we have in the Florida legislature. And that's to pass a balanced budget. Another thing that I wish my federal colleagues would, would do, at least every now and then. Um, we can't leave until the budget is balanced. Um, that is the only constitutional requirement we have. Until redistricting comes up, which will be, thankfully, in two years, uh, 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 balanced budget is the only thing. So it's the most important bill that we have in the Florida legislature. And the, the, the uh, budget we passed this year was $91 billion, which I believe is the largest budget, uh, at least in total, we've had. But I don't believe it's by any means the largest per capita, because obviously we're growing. I believe the budget passed the Senate unanimously, and it passed the House with only two no votes. So it was fairly bipartisan. Only two uh, folks uh, voted against it. And um, I like to always bring up this fact, and this is something that I steal from the Speaker of the House about the budget and thinking about what $91 billion means. Uh, we as a state passed New York State as third most in population about a year or two ago. So it goes California. Texas, Florida, and then New York. But New York and Florida are somewhat close. I think we may be a mil million more or so uh, residents now than New York is. So our, our budget is $91 billion. New York's is double. And the line I like to say is, I highly doubt that a New Yorker's quality of life is double that of a Floridian. So to me, it's very important that we use fiscal restraint. And frankly, I don't think we would have accomplished what we did in the state of Florida over the last eight years or so since the Great Recession, but for the tough decisions and fiscal restraint uh, that we had to show both in the legislature and certainly in the governor's office. To me, there are a number of bills, and certainly I'd, I'd, I'd be willing to talk about anything that you all uh, find interesting, but a couple bills I'd like to highlight. Um, this one was fairly controversial, I've got to say. It was an infrastructure bill that our Senate president uh, was very uh, keen on getting through uh, both chambers. I, I personally agreed with it um, because I think we need to be looking ahead. It puts a, a, a great deal, millions of dollars, into future infrastructure for toll roads and for other um, roads uh, in Florida. Think about it this way. Uh, uh, a city the size of Orlando is moving to Florida every year. And I see no end in sight to that growth. If we're not planning for that growth, um, we're going to be behind. I think we're behind right now anyway. But uh, that was a big priority. It was, it was fairly controversial. I think it was fairly split. Um, uh, but uh, it, that did pass both chambers, and that did uh, uh, get the, the approval of the governor. 
Certainly immigration was a, was a hot topic uh, in the legislature uh, and probably will be another issue we'll talk about and debate uh, this session. Uh, Senator Gruters uh, ran the uh, uh, Sanctuary Cities Bill, which banned Sanctuary Cities, which passed uh, both uh, chambers and uh, Governor DeSantis uh, signed it. Um, near and dear to my heart, we passed major environmental funding um, that, uh, frankly, we hadn't seen in this state in a while. Uh, I would like to see a bit more funding uh, in what's called Florida Forever. I don't know if you all have heard much about that, but that's for the protection of natural lands. Um, my family donated much of the land for the Robinson Preserve uh, in northwest Manatee County. And so to me, that's, that's, that's really almost an easy win environmentally, is frankly follow the will of the voters. They, they passed this uh, a couple years ago and, and get some of these funds uh, so we can acquire these properties and in these areas that are the most environmentally sensitive. I'm a huge fan of the Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast. Actually, I'm on the board of, of trustees. And that organization is charged with helping find properties in this area. And there's so many. There are so many properties along the Mayaka River, along the Manatee River, and our critical water basins that um, need protection. And I'm very, very, very proud of the work that we've done, uh, at least last session. But uh, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, we got a lot of work to do um, environmentally. Um, I was very proud, like I mentioned earlier, to serve on the Ag and Natural Resources Subcommittee. We did a lot of great work in that subcommittee. Unfortunately, a lot of this, the stuff we got through that committee didn't make it uh, across the finish line. Uh, a bill that I filed would have required a mandatory inspection of septic tanks. There currently, right now, is not a requirement under Florida law. There was one in 2012, and it was repealed. And the, the uh, bill sponsor in the House who advocated for the repeal says now that was a mistake. So to me it's a common sense type of solution and certainly Republicans and Democrats aren't going to agree on, on everything but this type of issue I think is hopefully something uh, I, I filed it in the House and Senator Gruters uh, filed it um, on the Senate side. I had several Democrats that, uh, that were in support of, of this concept. That's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, another piece of the puzzle, I continually, and I don't know what the answer is for this problem, I continually get frustrated with news reports of sewage spills uh, into our bays. Every other week, uh, I feel like we're reading about this spill or that spill, and um, it's frustrating. And uh, Senator Gruters frankly filed a bill that would penalize those jurisdictions that would do that. Um, now, now that flows down to the taxpayer, so there are some complications with that, but I'm a politician, so I like making fun of myself. I mean, politicians love to go to ribbon cuttings and fancy buildings and nice hospitals and nice uh, big, tall, shiny buildings. No one has a ribbon cutting in front of a, a sewer line you repair. Uh, so I, I think we have to have more of an effort both in the state uh, level to the, to the extent that there's funding for it, but at the local level at the local level to make sure that we're not going over capacity uh, uh, in some of these sewer, sewer systems and they are the most technological um, systems, uh, frankly, that they can be. Um, I do think we have some work to do um, in the environmental regulation field. Uh, uh, I don't think we get through some of the environmental issues that we have without some teeth in our statutes. And unfortunately, what the legislature sometimes does, and, and we all do this as families and business owners, you focus on what the problem is right now. The problem last year was that red tide, the awful red tide. So a lot of the money, resources, thought went into that problem. The year before, what was it? Parkland. I'm Parkland. This, the environmental issue is not necessarily going to be the issue top of mind for the next few years. So money will not always flow that direction. That's why you need environmental hammer, regulatory hammer, uh, to beat down on those that pollute our waterway. And to me, it's, it's, it's not only personal. Uh, like I said, look at District 71. Uh, look at Sarasota County. Look at Manatee. It's all almost, besides one side, surrounded by water. Water is the lifeblood of our area and our state. And I'll never forget for the rest of my career, I was out in a boat 
uh, Braden and Beach, right off Braden Beach, and I was with a mullet fisher. And we were um, doing a clan restoration project with Ed Childs. I don't know if you all know Ed. He's a great environmentalist, the son of, of Lawton Childs, actually the last uh, uh, Democratic governor uh, in the state of Florida. So he invited me on, on, on a boat, and we were, we were putting these, these clams into the water, and I, something like 20 gallons of water is cleaned a day uh, from these clams. And so the mullet fisherman turns to me, and he, and he turned to me, and he said, thank you, Representative Robinson, for what you're doing. And I, I said, well, you don't have to thank me, but why are you thanking me? And he said, well, this red tide has been devastating. I mean, this was the peak of the red tide. Uh, and he said, um, folks talk about not being able to, to go to the beach, which is tough, or not being able to, to spend their vacation uh, on the west coast of Florida, which is unfortunate. But I couldn't feed my family. I couldn't fish. And I had to um, be contracted out to pick up the dead fish uh, along the shore. And I can't imagine anything more um, frustrating uh, for, for this young man, uh, I think he had two children, than uh, to, to, for his livelihood to go from catching fish and helping someone to, to the stench of death, picking them up uh, net by net. So I think about that a lot. And, and frankly, I thought about him several times when I cast um, those votes in the Florida legislature. Um, I was especially proud of, of anything involving water quality issues. Certainly, the Moat Marine uh, funding uh, is going to help. And that, that, that is really going to help. I, I know there's some debate on do we need to study some more stuff. But uh, Moat Marine is the preeminent institution to help us tackle this thing. And um, I do not buy into the excuse that um, it's naturally occurring, so let's just not worry about it. The conquistadors uh, wrote about it, so it's always going to be in Florida. Well, that may be true, but I don't think it's going to be as bad as it's been unless we start doing something uh, about it. So I'm hopeful that there's a commitment, or certainly a commitment on my end, and I, I think our delegation, that's, that's, that's what's great about your delegation from, from Representative uh, Good to Senator uh, Gruders, to Representative Buchanan, to Representative uh, Gregory, to President Galvano. Uh, there, there are lots of folks, if not the entire delegation, that is committed to this issue. And it's really something that I'm very, very proud of uh, to serve with these, these people because I know that they have the best interest of our area uh, in mind. And uh, to me, it always goes back um, to what, what can we do to keep our great state moving forward? And in that dark time last summer, about this time, about a year ago, um, you know, folks were even saying, is this the end of Florida? I mean, if we have red tide every, every uh, summer, is Florida ever going to come back? If we have a second red tide like that, our family's going to stop vacationing here and go to North Carolina instead. So we've got we to gotta be very serious. We've got to be very vigilant. And I, I, I truly believe that this is a bipartisan issue that both Republicans and Democrats, our governor especially, our great governor, uh, who, who has frankly led on this issue, um, and the House and the Senate are hopefully going to continue uh, to do some things along with our, with our federal partners. Because uh, it, it is so incredibly important, and I'll wrap up with this. Um, uh, to me, I talked about the mullet fishermen, but to me it got personal at the Robinson Preserve when I saw the red tide and the dead fish in there. And that's my family's legacy. And uh, to see it almost under attack by a combination of natural and non-natural forces uh, it, it really hit home uh, for me. And if we think it's, it's fine now, which it appears to be, you know, we had a, an issue in the Manitou River. The Manitou River had blue-green algae for the first time in decades. So um, we need to continue to take our water quality seriously in the state of Florida because without water, um, th there's not a more basic fundamental right um, to us Floridians and to make sure uh, we have good quality drinking uh, water in our state for ourselves and for our kids. And uh, to me, that's something that I'm going to be focused on. Anytime you ask someone, why are you running, um, listen very carefully. Why are you running? I've, I've told you why I, why I ran and why I'm continue continuing to run. Um, that's to keep our great state uh, moving forward. We'll certainly have debates on necessarily what that means. But um, uh, to me, it always comes down to moving our great state uh, forward and what can we do uh, for that. So uh, I'll, I'll entertain any questions uh, that you may that you may have, uh, and I certainly uh, I cer certainly thank you for 
for uh, inviting me tonight. So thank you. My name's Jerry Stricker. Thank you for your service. And I was an elected official myself in Covington, Kentucky. I was a city commissioner and a mayor pro tem. But my question is, what can and should be done to make energy conservation a big deal in Florida? Mr. Stricker, we, we got to continue to make it a priority. Um, I, I think we're on the right track. Uh, I do think that uh, solar uh, is certainly something that we, we, we've made a priority in the state of Florida. Um, but to me, we haven't gone far enough. And uh, renewables is really where the answer is. And to me, I'd like to see more of that. And I don't have any specific or specific proposal, but I'm certainly all ears. Uh, but to me, I think that uh, the progress we've made uh, in trying to at least, whether it's incentivize, um, recycling, I think I read one day that one aluminum can is like uh, a week's worth of energy, uh, to make sure that folks out there, even the young folks out there, understand and appreciate how important our environment is and how important recycling and renewables are. My name's Bruce Weinstein. Came down to Florida in 1989. My concern is the last few years I've been reading quite a bit about people who die and leave their money to the state of Florida in trust for a specific purpose. But it seems like over the last few years, our representatives have basically been taking that money and doing whatever they want to with it as opposed to what is in the trust that the money is supposed to be spent on. Is that toning down, I hope? It is, um, and you're exactly right. The voters vote on certain things, whether it's uh, Florida Forever Fund, which I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, or, or you've probably heard of Sadowski, which is the affordable housing. It's actually, if you, if you sell your house and you pay what's called dock stamps to the state, there's a portion of that that goes uh, to Sadowski, which is supposed to go to affordable housing. Um, thankfully, um, and I talked to the appropriations chair about this, we actually funded Sadowski more uh, than we had in prior years. Unfortunately for this area, a lot of that money went to, to the Hurricane Michael area up in the Panhandle. Those folks were just devastated. So we may not see it uh, as much here, but the amount has gone up. Uh, but I, I agree with you 100%. We have these trust funds for a reason. It, let's at least be honest with the voters. If we're not, if we're not gonna use it in the purpose that they voted on, well then let's, let's take that to a vote or make them vote on it again. Um, let's try to avoid these bait and switch type of things. Thank you, sir, for that good question. Uh, I'm Rich Scissors, and thank you for coming and speaking to us tonight. Uh, speaking of solar, what can be done to make uh, solar available to people in apartments and condos and neighborhoods to share a, a uh, solar farm themselves? And that's a great question. It's, it's, it's a lot of people ask me, what can they do? when big government isn't acting in their best interest. And I said, well, we got to take control of, of, of who you are and your carbon footprint. I mean, do you know how much fertilizer maybe, I know this isn't a solar issue, but uh, how much fertilizer you may be overusing or could you, could you use a different type of grass that maybe, so there, and Sarasota County, by the way, has a great website on little things that we can do as homeowners. And solar is kind of another one. Unfortunately, it is, for, for at least now, so expensive. Uh, for, for folks to afford to put a solar panel. So we have to incentivize it uh, as a state. And I do believe we have some good grant programs both in the state and in the federal system to hope break down the, the cost. But I don't think we've gone anywhere uh, far enough, uh, frank, certainly in the federal system. Um, Y'all may know more than I would uh, as to exactly what, the, what, what is out there, but we certainly could be doing a lot more in the solar area. I think the issue is, is individual homeowners can do that, but collective individuals like in an apartment complex or a condo or even a whole neighborhood, you know, going out and leasing or purchasing a solar farm. There's no mechanism in Florida to do that. Okay. Okay. I wasn't aware of that, but but thank you. Thank you. I've got two questions for you, please. The one is if the state of Florida is still using the cost check method of voter uh identification or whatever you want to call it. Is cross-check still in place in Florida? I have not heard of that term. So unfortunately, I, I don't have the answer to, 
to whether or not we use it in Florida? Well, it's a very controversial way of limiting people voting if you if you study the situation, which I have. And it's uh, costs a lot of voters there. Uh, what's happening is if you, if there's identical names throughout the country, this was done by Chris Kovac, the attorney, uh, secretary of state in Kansas. And what he did is took a list of people with the same names. If one was a felon, everybody was disqualified off the list, no matter where they're at. Plus, if you were registered in two states, that was limited. There was thousands of people. Okay, number two, you mentioned the toll roads. Is that will that be a privatization of the roads? I think it's to be determined. I I would hopeful hope, hopefully they wouldn't be private. From my, from my standpoint, um, I would like to see them public. But uh, that's something way out in the future that there's frankly a commission right now made up of citizens and and politicians that are looking at that issue right now. I'm not a part of that commission. I actually, met for the first time, uh, I believe, two weeks ago. But that's probably one of the topics that they will decide. My name is Jeffrey Morris, and the group from all right you're speaking today are composed of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. It's a nonpartisan group. And within our group and within the polls that we see, there seems to be a, if one, for lack of a better term, a consensus that there should be some restrictions on the assault weapons that the legislature doesn't seem to want to address for whatever reason. And I was wondering if you could speak to us specifically how you feel about that or, and what you see the legislature doing in the future. And I realize you're just one person, but you have the ear of the legislature and we don't. No, I mean, I'm, I'm frustrated uh, with where we are. Um, more as a nation, I, I think in the, in the state we, we, we passed a a pretty comprehensive bill, as you all know, um, that had some pretty critical components to it. Um, but we have one of these uh, mass shootings uh, every week uh, in our country. And uh, t to me, it's, it's frustrating. And uh, you know, certainly it, it's tough because the, uh, the semi-assault weapon ban that, that was proposed in the legislature, uh, at least by my count, would eliminate about 80% of the guns uh, in Florida. Uh, so many of my constituents have grave concerns, and I do. Uh, about about that approach, um, I, I I am pleased to hear that certainly from the president uh, the, the the Senate president side that uh, we are going to take another look at this uh, to see what else uh, or what gaps uh, we're missing because um, it's it there there are there are too many of these shootings going on uh, in the country and um, we all seem to go whether we're Republicans or Democrats we all seem to go in our separate corners uh, when one of these tragedies occur and try to shout over each other and, and point at each other, I'm right, you're wrong, and nothing uh, seems to happen. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, we'll continue to look at this problem and uh, see what we can come together and agree on. Would you be willing to support legislation where you would put forth a bill perhaps to limit some type of restriction on assault weapons? No. No. Um, I don't frankly think necessarily it would work. Uh, and secondly, um, I'm duty bound uh, to protect our Second Amendment. And, um, uh, and until we try every single thing um, before that, I'm not going to limit someone's Second Amendment rights um, by, by that approach. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much uh, for doing this tonight. It's very helpful. My name is Andy Tugendhat, and like I said during my introduction, I'm a, uh, an act activist here in town, mostly in the area of climate change uh, and energy. I work extensively with both the city and the county around energy efficiency as well as renewable energy. So just a couple of comments and questions. Uh, Florida has does not have any state incentives for solar actually um, at this time. It did at one point, but it, in terms of policies, it's one of the most backward in the country, uh, one of the least progressive as far as incentivizing renewable energy. Uh, the comment that uh, uh, Rick meant, uh, Rich mentioned earlier around community solar, you can't do community solar in Florida because there's a restriction on who can sell electricity in, uh, in Florida. And you, and you can't have net metering, uh, virtual net metering, which is what's required to be able to do 
apartment level or condo level solar. So it's not it's not going to happen until your organization changes those rules. So we need uh, dramatic changes in the rules around renewable energy and energy conservation in Florida to be able to become more, uh, I guess, be among the leaders in what's going on in the country and elsewhere. Another policy that's necessary where there was a bill introduced and there will be again is around a renewable portfolio standard which requires a certain amount of electricity from to be generated from renewable sources. Would you support a policy like that? It sounds reasonable. I'd obviously like to look at the language uh, of it, uh, and certainly any, any ideas uh, you have both tonight and offline, uh, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, I, would, I will definitely give you my friend. I'd, I'd love to do that. And I, I just, just one comment about the tall roads. I, I don't know of any environmental organizations that that support that, that don't think those tall, tall roads are a, a, a real disaster in the making environmentally. Well, um, we got to do a good job of making sure those roads don't impact uh, environmental areas. And, and, and I'm hopeful that we'll do the job we need to do. Thank you. Let's uh, give the representative a big hand. And thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.